despite it crawling underneath the skin of some people, Jesus built and paid for only one church. Have you memorized Matthew 16, 18 yet? It might not be a bad idea to, to dial that one away. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, meaning Peter's confession of Christ, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that says what it says. And it means what it means. We can like it. We can lump it. We can ignore it. We can accept it. But that verse teaches what it teaches. Jesus built one church. Time and popular opinion will not alter the meaning and application of the ancient writings of Holy Spirit inspired men of God. Though the Lord built one church, you will come across that term church is in the Bible. For example, Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with an holy kiss, regulating a custom of the time. But the next sentence says, the churches of Christ salute you. One church with various locations all throughout the world, especially in the first century. So when you read churches, what does that mean? It does not mean denominations. It means congregations of the Lord's one true church. Open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapters 2 and 3. That's where we'll be tonight. And we'll be discussing some about the seven churches of Asia. Does that mean the seven denominations? No. Does that mean the seven periods or ages of church history? No. That means the seven congregations of these localized churches of Christ. Now, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 record the words of Jesus Christ to seven local congregations of the one church. Have you ever asked yourself, why these congregations? The best answer I can give you is twofold, and it's pretty reasonable. Number one, these specific congregations, that is, those of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, needed the encouragements, rebukes, and promises that they received from the Lord. That's pretty obvious. But then number two, probably a little bit more practical and really gets to the heart of the matter a little bit more. These congregations, the seven churches, seven locations of the one church in Asia were situated along an ancient Roman postal road and were thus distribution points for other congregations throughout the world to receive this inspired document. We're trying. This is the last one I'll do. I don't know what everybody else is going to do next week. They can do whatever they want to do. We're trying to answer the question. Not of what must I do to be saved, though we'll answer that at the end of this sermon. But the gist of these sermons in January, even morning and evening, have been what must I do to stay saved. We understand how to get into Christ. We understand we need to abide in Christ. Well, what does that look like? So tonight we're going to entitle this sermon, and you'll see why directly, Be Faithful Unto Death. Three things we want to do tonight. The first one is we're going to talk about some things that hinder our faithfulness. They're going to come right from the text of these seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Second, we're going to talk about some things that help our faithfulness. Same, same congregations in many instances. And then third, we're going to have to talk about the honesty that we need to possess in order to make the changes. Why preach on faithfulness? Well, it's not to condemn it's to help convince us that the Bible is right and that we can do this. We can see the standard laid out in the scriptures and we can hit it. So let's begin. Let's talk in the first place about some things that hinder our faithfulness. The first one we're going to call drifting. Drifting. Notice Revelation chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, what does that indicate? That despite the praises this congregation in Ephesus received, there were still things that needed to be corrected among this congregation as a whole. Nevertheless, I, is that in red letters? That means this is Jesus. Not that it would carry any more weight than any other inspired person, but this is what Jesus, the head of the church, is saying to his body, specifically in Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, meaning the Lord has a problem with the church of Christ. Have you ever heard of it? Right there it is in the Bible, isn't it? 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left. The idea here as in a period of cooling off or spiraling downward, perhaps it would be best expressed as drifting. This is not a total apostasy, but they are spiraling in the wrong direction. What does he say? Because thou hast left, cooled off, spiraled downward, thy first love. Their initial zeal and depth of devotion for Christ and his church was headed in the wrong direction. Now this is a church of Christ and they're headed in the wrong direction. Does that, what does that tell us that could happen to us if we're not careful? Verse number five, remember therefore. Observe that. You need to reflect back. Remember therefore from whence thou, that's the whole church, specifically the one at Ephesus, thou art fallen. The idea here of fallen is to come to a worse state. This is not total apostasy, and we'll see that here in just a second. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. They were an exalted position in the Lord's eyes, but they're, they're spiraling downward. They're drifting the wrong direction. And notice, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. You need to change your mind. When you change your mind, your actions cannot help but follow. Repentance is part of the gospel plan of salvation, but repentance is not a point act. We have to repent in order to get into Christ, but what happens when we sin once we're in Christ? We're still going to have to repent again when we do that which is wrong. You may want to look at Matthew 21, 28 to 30, Acts 26, 20. There are numerous passages throughout the New Testament that give us an example. What does it look like to repent? You can, you can read the, the Bible and see. Now observe this, a scriptural congregation of the Lord's people. That's what these people were at Ephesus. They were a scriptural congregation of the Lord's people. Listen carefully. Does not forfeit its right to exist because it makes a mistake. Do you understand that? We don't forfeit our right to exist because we make a sinful choice. However, that sinful choice or choices must be corrected. And sometimes... It, can, it needs to be done on a congregational level. But understand that any congregation is made up of what? Members in particular. So as there can be good things throughout the whole congregation, in time, at times there can be bad things throughout the whole congregation. A scriptural church does not forfeit its right to exist when that church makes a mistake. However, what? That church... Sometimes congregationally must repent, change their mind, and change their actions. Observe what the Lord says. Repent and do the first works. That doesn't mean hear, believe, repent, confess, and be immersed in water again. That means simply this. They needed to return to their former degree of love for the truth. Remember the zeal that we used to have for Christ and the church. But what had happened? In Ephesus, they were spiraling the wrong way. So they needed to change their minds, do the first works, meaning what? Get back to that initial love and zeal for and of the truth. Observe what the Lord says, or else. This is not a threat, friend. This is a promise. You see some praise. You see some problems. But here you're going to see some promises. This is not a threat. This is a promise. Or else... I will come unto thee quickly and will remove, observe the language, will remove thy candlestick. Now, if left and fallen mean a total apostasy, then why the promise to remove? So when we look back in verse 4, thou hast left thy first love, it says thou art fallen in verse 5, that doesn't mean they had totally apostatized from the truth, but if they were to continue on that downward spiral, they were going to be removed. So said who? So said the head. So said Jesus. Look at it. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except if and only if thou repent. They were going to fall from their exalted and favored position in the eyes of the Godhead and brethren. Just looking at that. If I didn't say anything else about it. If I just stood up here and read that. That's serious language. Is it not? If I didn't do any bit of explanation, if I just stood here and read that, that is serious language, is it not? Indeed it is. So what do we see? Jesus doesn't play around with foolishness. 
And we're going to read what happens in Revelation 2.10, to be thou faithful unto death. He means that. And if we don't accept that and obey that, we will be removed. Is that what we want? No. So, hindrance number one is drifting. Hindrance number two is going to come from Revelation 2, verses 14 and 15, and it is defilement. Still talking about things that hinder. One is drifting. Another one is defilement. Observe this interesting language in Revelation 2, 14 and 15. But, in contrast to the praise, I, that's Jesus, have a few things against thee. That's serious, isn't it? He's not talking about the denominations down the road. He's talking about his own church in a local congregation. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of of the Nicolaitans. Did Jesus call their name? He said it plain. He didn't beat around the bush. He got right to it. But we'll look at it. So hast thou then also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. How do you feel about that, Lord? How do you feel about that doctrine in one of your churches? Which thing I hate. Now, is that plain? Interesting language. Look back at it. They eat meat sacrificed to idols as an act of worship in the heathen temples was sinful then, and in fact, it would even be sinful today if we tried to do that. Fornication is unlawful sex. That is any sex outside of the lawful marriage bond. So we can see that. that there can even be some serious foolishness going on among the Lord's church, right? Among the called out ones, the sanctified ones, those who have been washed from their past sins by the blood of Christ. We can sometimes get mixed up in some of the same stuff that caused us to be lost in the first place, can't we? So you see the importance of sermons on faithfulness? We can forget these things. Now observe there, he said, Jesus said, verse 15, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, it's difficult to say what that is, but here's what I know. It was sinful. It was wrong. Whatever it was specifically, I think we can come to a reasonable conclusion that it probably had something to do with idolatry, eating that meat in those idolatrous temples as an act of worship. And sometimes when they would get in those idolatrous temples, they would literally fornicate and say that you're in this temple and it's okay for you to do that. And Jesus says, oh, oh, mm -mm. this is not how the Lord's people act and conduct themselves. Now, that's pretty serious, isn't it? What are some things that can hinder our faithfulness? Do you see that defilement can certainly hinder our faithfulness to Christ? We need to put the sin out of our lives. And then the third thing that can hinder our faithfulness is deception. Observe the language of Revelation 2, verses 20 and 21. Look at what it says. Notwithstanding, meaning what? Most of the time, there's a general outline to the way the Lord speaks to these congregations. There are some properties of Christ given. There's praise given to the congregation. And then problems are addressed. However, there's two congregations that the Lord didn't have any bad thing to say about the whole congregation. But by and large, the majority of them, there were problems that had to be dealt with. Notwithstanding, Revelation 2.20, I, Jesus, have a few things against thee. You don't want to hear that. But why is the Lord saying this? Because he loves them and doesn't want them to die in this condition. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Notice verse 21. And I, that's Jesus, gave her summarized as Jezebel, the so-called prophetess, I gave her space, I gave her time to repent of her fornication. I have all wondered in my mind, how long is it? How, how long did the Lord give her space to repent of her fornication? I don't know the answer to that. But you know, there's one thing that always has stuck out in my mind. When Jonah went into Nineveh, he said, yet 40 days, yet 40 days, and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. 
Now, when you start tracking down time, how much time is God going to give people? God gave those in Nineveh in Jonah's day how long? Forty days. You think about that. Now, I'm not saying that God gave, that the Lord gave her 40 days, but what I'm saying is when you try to run down how much time is enough time, it was enough time in Nineveh's day for 40 days for them to make up their minds one way or another. Thus said the Lord. Now, we can say we're praying about things for months and months and months and studying on things for years and years and years. Come on. What did Jesus say? I gave her space. I gave her a time period to repent of her fornication, and in that time period, in that space, whatever it was, what happened? She didn't change. She didn't change her mind. She didn't change her actions. A few quick things. Number one, false teachers almost always encourage others to give in to the lust of the flesh by gratifying and satisfying our every whim, whether it's wealth, women, worldliness of all sorts. What had this false prophetess Jezebel weaseled her way in among the Lord's church and convinced them? Ah, a little fornication won't hurt. Ah, a little idolatry and idolatrous practices won't hurt. And it did hurt, didn't it? So we've noticed three quick things that hinder or can hinder our faithfulness. Drifting, defilement, and deception. Now in the second place, let's talk about three things that help our faithfulness. The first one is going to be discipline. Back up to Revelation 2 and verse number 6. Friends, brethren, we must learn to think as God thinks. How do we do that? We're going to have to study his word daily. Observe Revelation 2 and verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou, the congregation at Ephesus in the first century, hatest. See that est? That's the same thing as F. It shows continuous action most of the time. Hades, the deeds, not only the doctrine, but the deeds, whatever they did, of the Nicolaitans. And how did Jesus feel about that? We've read about how he felt about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, what about their deeds? The church at Ephesus hated them. And Jesus said, which I also hate. That takes discipline. In order to stand up and oppose anything, it takes discipline. And if we're going to know what we're supposed to oppose, we're going to have to think like God thinks. How are we going to think like God thinks with closed Bibles? We're going to go by the whims and the fancies of culture, time, and society? Why, that changes almost daily sometimes, doesn't it? So we need to stick with what is written. If the Lord is opposed to it, what are we? Then we're opposed to it. If God is not opposed to it, if it's good in the way that God says it, then we don't need to budge from that either. What's going to help us be faithful? Discipline. Meaning what? What saith the scripture? What does God say? If Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, whatever they were, when we figure out what they are, how do we need to feel about the deeds of the Nicolaitans? We need to just love them. We'll love them. Oh, that's a non-issue. Wait a minute. Jesus, what did Jesus say? Look at it. But this thou hast that thou, the church, hate as. Same thing. It's continuous action. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. How do you feel about that, Jesus? What did he say? Which I also hate. Discipline. Word number two, diligence. Observe Revelation 2 and verse 13. The gospel of Christ is the only religion on the planet, in the world, in the universe, with the divine authority to exist. Any religious body calling itself anything, if it doesn't match up with what's written, it ain't right. Revelation 2 and verse 13. I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, Jesus' name, and hast not denied my faith. What is the Lord's faith? It's the New Testament. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the things written from Matthew to Revelation. Observe it. 
Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. What's the point? That takes diligence, doesn't it? In spite or despite of all the worldliness all around us, despite of our society saying this is okay and that's okay, we need to stick with what's written in the Bible. We need to stick with the things that we can prove to be right. You know what that takes? It takes diligence, doesn't it? Word number three, determination. Look at Revelation 3, verses 7 and 8. Discipline, diligence, this is going to help us. And then third, determination. Observe Revelation 3, verses 7 and 8. And to the angel, observe. Most of us hear the word angel and we think some sort of heavenly messenger. And perhaps, by and large, the majority of the time in the Bible, that's what it means. But this is not written to a heavenly messenger. This is written to a human being. Perhaps it was the preacher, perhaps it was the eldership, but it was the messenger, that's the simple meaning of the word angel, of this congregation. And to the angel, the messenger, the human messenger of the church, the called out ones, the one true church built and established by Christ, in Philadelphia, a city, one of the seven churches, one of the seven cities in the region of Asia, addressed in these chapters, right. These things saith he that is holy. Observe the properties of Christ. He that is true. That's talking about Jesus. He that hath the key of David. That's talking about Jesus. He that openeth and no man shutteth. That's talking about Jesus. And shutteth and no man openeth. But notice verse 8. What does Jesus know? Jesus knows what goes on in and among his churches. Do you see that? He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast, this congregation in Philadelphia in the first century, thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. You'll read this about what Jesus says of the church at Philadelphia, and in chapter 2, the church at Smyrna, you won't find any problems won't find where Jesus himself, he says, I know thy works. He doesn't say a bad word, a negative word to Smyrna, and he doesn't say a bad word or a negative word to Philadelphia. Now observe this about Philadelphia, because we're going to have to make up in our minds and be determined to be faithful. Now, it would appear that this congregation in Philadelphia did not have a thousand members, and it would appear that they did not have a $25,000 weekly contribution, yet... They receive no criticism from Jesus himself. Brethren, it doesn't take any more than what we have here right now. If we're determined in our minds that we're going to be faithful unto death, there ain't nobody going to shut that door. We have to determine it in our minds. We don't have to say, well, if we had this or if we had that or if we, uh uh-uh. Don't worry about what we don't have. What do we have? Who do we have? And let's be thou faithful unto death. We're going to have to make that up in our minds because that's going to help us be faithful. And then third, third, let's talk quickly about the honesty that is needed to make the changes. Word number one is discovery, discovery. Some form of the word repent is mentioned eight times in Revelation chapters two and three. What does that tell you? That even as members of the church, when we get mixed up in sin, We need to repent. We need to change our mind and our actions. Observe Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 19. What does Jesus say? And really in this context to the church of the Laodiceans or the church at Laodicea, he didn't have much good to say to them at all. But he still said what he said in Revelation 3 and verse 19. As many, what did Jesus say? As many as I love. People hear sermons on correction or things that we need to change, and they take it as hate speech. It is not. As many as I love, what do you do, Lord? I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore. What does he tell his church to do? And repent. Change your mind. Change your actions. Brethren, when we know better, we need to do better. Pleading ignorance is no longer acceptable. 
So says Acts 17, 30, and 31. It's time for us, this local congregation, which is comprised of members in particular, so that means each of us as individuals, it's time for us to examine all our beliefs and all our practices as individuals and, yes, as a collective whole in the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Or are we too afraid? What are we going to be afraid of? If we're doing what the Bible teaches to be right, what do we have to be afraid of? If we put everything that we believe and everything that we practice, run it through the New Testament, and if it passes the test, we don't have anything to worry about. Nothing at all. But if we run it through the test of the New Testament and it doesn't pass, what we need to do? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's scriptural. So the first word we need to know is discovery. When we know better, we need to do better. We're not going to be able to plead ignorance on the day of judgment. No one. Not as a congregation and not as individuals. Word number two is defense. Now once we've proven our beliefs and actions to be in full harmony with the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, then we need to stand and not budge. Once we've run them through the New Testament and they pass the test, don't budge. Back up to Revelation chapter 2 and observe verses 2 and 3. Speaking again to the congregation here at Ephesus. Revelation 2 and verse 2, Jesus says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. Now they'd run it through the test. And what did those at Ephesus find those who claimed to be apostles to be? And hast found them, I didn't write this. What did it say? Found them liars. You think people will lie to you in religion? They did here. You think they'd quit? No. But those at Ephesus had sense enough to know, we need to test this. We need to try this. Don't just accept anything that anybody says. Check it by the New Testament. Verse number three, and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Observe that. We preach the truth. We rebuke and oppose all doctrinal error. We shun the wrong and we do the right. So we're going to have to defend what we have proven to be the truth. Because some people are going to say, that's not right. Well, let's let the Lord settle that. Let's let the New Testament settle what we believe and what we practice. Once we've run it through the ringer, so to speak, and we've proven it to be right, now what? Don't budge. Don't back off. Don't back down. Stand upon that which is written. Word number three is disaster. Disaster. Life is hard. No one checks out of here alive unless Christ first comes, and even then will be translated. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Who knows what that feels like until it happens? What does it, what does it feel like to be translated? <laughs> you won't know unless the Lord comes back, and then guess what? We'll all figure out what that feels like at the same time. You understand? Now, we preach on faithfulness to encourage every member of this local congregation to do better and to be better than what we have done in the past. But we also preach on faithfulness to avoid disasters. We can change for the better today. We don't have to wait till tomorrow. In fact, we can change for the better right now. Observe the text of Revelation 3. And verse number six, do we want to change? If we, and what we've heard and read tonight, it's serious. Do we want to change? Revelation 3 and verse six, he that hath an ear, meaning, do you want to hear this? He that hath an ear, meaning, if you're willing to listen, then be willing to obey, right? Or do we have faithfulness nailed down? need to hear anything about faithfulness. We're being faithful. What are you talking about faithfulness for? All right. He that hath an ear, willing to listen, let him hear, let him obey what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You ought to track that phrase down and see how many times with cer certain derivations Jesus says that to these seven congregations located in Asia. He that hath an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit, not what Brock says. Who says? What the Spirit says or saith unto the churches. Told you we'd look at Revelation 2.10. Look at what it says. Revelation 2.10 is a promise, but it is a promise with conditions. Revelation 2.10, Jesus says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. There's going to be hard times. I don't know if anybody's told you that or not. There's going to be difficulties that occur as a member of the Lord's church. And just as a, really a human being, there's going to be hard times. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil, that Satan, shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. It won't last forever. What does the Lord say here? Be thou faithful unto. It doesn't say until. We don't stop at death's door. We have to walk on through those doors. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will. That's a promise, but it's based upon what? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Do we desire to receive a crown of life? What are we going to have to do according to Revelation 2.10? Be thou. Yes, the whole church, but the church is comprised of individuals. We as individuals are going to have to be faithful unto death. Since that's the case, that we want to receive a crown of life, then we cannot ever give up on Christ or the gospel. You know, another word that you ought to run down in these two chapters is the word overcome. Look at one more passage with me in Revelation 3 and verse 21. Jesus says to him, that's even the individual, to him that overcome eth. It's not a point action. It's continuous action. We've got to keep on overcoming unto death. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Isn't that beautiful language? You want to be with Jesus? You want to be with the father? You want to be with the Holy Spirit? Then we're going to have to be in Christ, number one, and we're going to have to be faithful unto death, number two. We must overcome the trials and temptations of this life in order to go to heaven. Now, all this faithfulness is not going to do anybody any good until we're in the right spiritual location. The right spiritual location is to be in Christ. That's to become a member of the body of Christ, a member of the church of Christ. What must I do to be saved? Got to hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Got to believe the gospel, John 8, 24. Got to repent of sin, Acts 3, 19. Confess openly and freely that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And there has to be a death. We have to die to sin to be saved from sin. You know where we die to sin? It's when we're buried with Christ in baptism, Romans 6, 1 to 7. But that is a burial, it is a death, it is a burial, but it's also a resurrection. We're raised up to walk in newness of life. All our past sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been raised up a saint. We buried that sinner, we raised up a saint, and now we're to walk in newness of life as servants of righteousness. We're to be thou faithful unto death. But sometimes, even faithful servants stumble. They stumble into sin. Does that mean that we just overlook it and we just go on about life? Well, no. No, 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 no. We need to do what the Lord says once we once we're been added by the Lord to the church and then we sin. What do we have to do? Acts 8 22. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Wherever you are, come now. Together we stand as we sing a song of encouragement.